Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine. We're rolling. We're back. Uh, not completely uh, without some wounds. There's there's no water in the office. The pipes are broken. The banana trees are dead. And uh, other than that, I think we're doing great. But, you know, I went from New York to Houston to escape the winter weather. I mean, what's going on? It's just crazy. But Texas is recovering. We're very resilient, and we will be back and better than ever. Uh, but the interesting thing is when things were down again, I got to watch a little TV, and uh, I watched uh, authorities you know, on COVID say, we're going to have this tremendous March surge. And then two minutes later, I had another set of authorities saying, we're going to reach herd immunity by April. And I'm sitting there like, what? <laughs> what? How can the public possibly understand what's going on when I can't even figure out what's going on listening to all the consultants on the TV? So I thought we'd spend a little bit of time trying to explain what's going on in the country today. But first, let's talk about a little bit about uh, our numbers here in, in the Texas Medical Center. They're actually very, very good. Our R number, our famous R number, is well less than one. It's been down for uh, quite a while now. It's down under 0.7 today. Our case numbers are down, uh, and our percentage testing is down. And the, the, uh, if you look at the percentage of tests go that are positive, it's really pretty dramatic. I mean, there's been a really big fall since uh, end of uh, January. And ho hospitalizations, which I've said many times as a lagging indicator, are also uh, falling. So, you know, and that's reflective of what's, what's going on nationally. Nationally, the numbers are, are looking uh, very, very good. Of course, uh, unfortunately, we uh, also reached one of the really sad milestones, which is we have 500,000 people who have passed away from this virus. And so, uh, you know, it's sad, it's sad to think about it for the, the, the impact this has had on our country. And uh, the president suggested we fly our uh, flags at half staff, and we are doing that uh, to recognize everyone who suffered through this pandemic. But, you know, let's talk about what's going on, because I really think it's not as hard as the experts uh, try to make it uh, appear. So let's go start back with the the, some basics. Remember the R number? We talked a lot about that reproductive number. That is the number of people an index case will infect if you're completely susceptible. And we know that the R number for this particular virus is 2.7. Now, there's some caveats. The new variants are, you know, more infectious, so the R number might be slightly higher, as high as three or three and a half or four. But it's not 18. It's not the measles. It's but it's high. And then if you go back and look at what are the things that impact that R number. So the R naught is what happens when you don't do anything, but the effect of R number is what happens when we start factoring all the things we can do to mitigate that. And one of the important ones, most of all, is infections that we can produce per contact. The single thing we do the most to prevent that is wearing masks. I mean, it's, masks have been incredibly effective at preventing the number of infections per contact with individuals. And the other really big important variable in that effect of our number is how susceptible is the population. So every time more and more people get infected, the population becomes less and less susceptible. More and more people get vaccinated, the population becomes less and less susceptible. So that R number, instead of being a 2.7, begins to fall. And remember, every number above one is really an exponential uh, increase. And so the numbers rise very quickly above one, and they similarly fall below one. If it's one, if R equals one, then it's linear. One person infects one, two infect two. If it's above one, it's exponential. So when we talk about herd immunity, it's not that complicated. In fact, it is a, it's really based on that R number. Uh, and so... It's, it's, if our, our number is 2.7, the herd immunity is achieved when 60% of the population is, uh, is no longer susceptible. If it goes up to four, let's say, throw in all the variants of concern, then it's about 70% of the population. I do not know why a lot of people are saying it has to be 85%. It doesn't. It's between 60 and 70%. 
measles, which is, you know, recall is the most infectious virus we know, our value like 14, 15, 16, you have to have 95% of the population resistant. And that's the reason why when people stop vaccinating against measles, you get measles outbreaks right away. But our target to get to herd immunity is 60 to 70 percent. So let's talk about that. How many people have actually been infected in this country? You know, we really don't know. We all guess, well, we know that there have been 25 million people who we've diagnosed by qPCR. But what's the real number of people who have been infected? Because there's lots of people who are asymptomatic, and we don't know. And the only way you can tell is by doing a prevalence study. A prevalence study is where you actually measure antibodies in people and see who's been exposed. They may have been asymptomatic, but they got exposed and are now resistant. So we did a prevalence study in Houston. And what we found was that 14% of Houstonians have already been infected by this virus. And it was exactly four times the number of people that we diagnosed using qPCR. That number, four times more, five times more, is about the same as what they found in New York and in other communities that have actually done a, uh, a prevalence study. So if that's the case, and now we think that 30 million people in the United States have been diagnosed with this disease, multiply that times four, and you get to about 120 million. So about a third of the population in the United States has been infected by this virus. That's a lot of people. It's not 60%. And it's not 70%, but it's a third of the, of, the, of the patient population. Well, some people might argue with that. Say, well, you know, how do you know, you know that's the same? Well, there's another way to look at it, case fatality rate. We know that this particular virus is about five-fold more, uh, has five-fold more mortality than flu, let's say. Well, we just hit a terrible milestone of 500,000 deaths. If the case fatality rate is about 0.5%, which is five times more than flu, that would be 100 million people infected. So whether you'd look at it through case fatality rate or the prevalence study, it's about 100 million people, 120 million people in the United States who've been infected. So the New York Times did a very interesting uh, publication that looked at what would happen if you sort of predict the number of vaccinations going up and the people who have infected, when can we achieve uh, herd immunity? And they were hoping that if we get up to two and a half to three million vaccines a day, we might be able to get in May or June. And if not, we'll sort of hit it by July. The trouble with that, when you look at that number, is that's based only on achieving herd immunity through vaccination and, uh, either, and either natural infection. The thing is though, we forget all the time to add in the fact that we actually have been following public health suggestions. We do wear masks. And in fact, we talked a few months ago about the correlation between mask wearing and the prevention of the disease. It turns out it's linear. It's, it's amazing. So if you wear masks, it really reduces uh, the amount of infection in a community. Well, a lot of people have asked, well, how can you estimate the impact of wearing masks. Well, actually, we know the impact because we know the R value is 2.7. And we've been following R numbers throughout this country in every location throughout the United States, including our own every day. And the R number has been pretty consistently around 1.3, 1.4, not 2.7. That's about 50% effective. So it, it turns out we have a lot of data that shows our public health measures are about 50% effective. Now, if you add up our, our, our public health measures at 50% uh, at of the population and a third of the population has already been infected, that's around 80% effective. Now, that's not herd immunity, but that's functionally herd immunity. So if that's the case, what would you expect? the numbers should start to improve. Well, I just took the liberty of taking the recent curve and drawing it myself. And it looks like as you go up, an exponential curve looks like this. And the rise of infections in our country looks just like an exponential curve. And as fewer and fewer people are available to be infected because they're either wearing a mask or they've had the disease, 
it begins to plateau. And when you reach herd immunity, true herd immunity or functional herd immunity, I'm going to call it, the numbers begin to plateau, and they plateau very rapidly. And uh, Chris Amos and our group of, uh, in our Institute for Clinical Translational Research and his colleagues have actually modeled out how fast it would fall. And the fall is very similar to the fall that we're seeing currently. So frankly, I don't think it's hard to explain. The problem we had with the surge in the fall that led to so many infections is now the reason why we're seeing a decline because we've had about 30% of the country infected and people continue to wear their masks and practice social distancing. Together, that brings the R number below one. And that is why we are improving so rapidly. And by the way, across the United States, it's not just in the Texas Medical Center, it's, er it's everywhere. So what things can screw it up for us? Because we're all, you know, we're a country that we're, we can always screw up something even when we don't want to. So there's two things that can do it. One is the variance of concern. So these have higher R numbers. If the variance of concern, the United Kingdom variant and the uh, South African and Brazilian variants become the dominant strain, then that R number is going to be a lot higher. And so that's a concern that would slow the decline and could even cause a second outbreak. And then the other thing that could slow the decline is if people stop practicing public health measures because that 50% effectiveness is in the is a replacement for the vaccine vaccination. So until everybody's vaccinated, we need to continue to really stress mass wearing. So let's talk about the variance of concern because that's that's something beyond what we can do personally. So not surprisingly, they're spreading pretty uh, pretty fast. Uh, just uh, February 8th, there were like 700 cases, and February 18th, there are now 1,600 reported cases. They're in 33 states, and we know that there are 60 in Texas. The South African variant is here. Uh, there are only 21 that have been reported, but there's probably a lot more. And the Brazilian variant is also here. There's five, none in Texas yet. But, you know, that's a real concern. So if that becomes more and more prevalent across the country, that fall that we're seeing will begin to taper off. That's why it's a race to get more and more people vaccinated as fast as we can. So if you kind of look at what's happened, we've had three waves, very distinct waves. You can see them, little one, slightly bigger, and biggest of all. And the kinds of questions I get were, well, why is each wave so much bigger? Well, if you understand compound interest and you have a 401k, you'll understand why it's bigger. Every time you have a surge upon a slightly larger surge, it gets bigger. And so as long as we continue to have a lot of cases in the country, when there is a surge, it'll be much bigger than the previous ones. But what really happened? So that little tiny bump in the beginning with the spring surge, as we called it, that was really urban seeding from foreign travelers. That was the introduction of the virus into urban environments. Uh, and that's when we sheltered in place and closed businesses, and it actually began to come down. And, you know, things started looking pretty good until Memorial Day. And then we started having fun again. You know, people got tired of it, Memorial Day, and we had a giant <laughs> kind of surge after Memorial Day that sort of began to come down uh, in late August. And then really the biggest surge of all was in the fall when sort of mid-September, early October, cases really began to skyrocket. And, you know, while it's debated, my own personal opinion is that was the famous uh, massive spreading event called opening of colleges and universities. Because what happened then is they got, we had thousands of cases in big state schools and they, a lot of times they closed the school and sent all the kids home. And the, the, the third wave was really not in urban environments. It was in small communities and in rural communities. And I think that was from massive seeding from kids spreading it from colleges and then back in, into their homes. So to me, that's really what's been going on. Now, will there be a fourth wave, fourth surge? I don't think there will be, if, but it's up to us. If we continue to be rigorous around mask wearing and we can get our vaccinations up to two and a half million a day, I think we will see a slowing of the decline, but I hope we won't have a surge. But that's really up to us. If people stop being vigilant on public health and physical distancing, 
wearing masks, then we absolutely could have a giant surge. So that's my, I'm opti my optimistic self is, as long as we keep up what we're doing and vaccinations continue to go, I think we will be okay by middle of summer. But we do need to continue to focus on wearing masks until 65 or 70 percent of the population has been vaccinated. The other thing that's come up a lot is teachers. I've been asked a zillion questions about teachers. Shouldn't they all be vaccinated before they go to school? Well, the CDC is, is, is recommending that uh, you know, that they're a priority, but that you, do, you can reopen schools without having all the teachers uh, vaccinated as long as you practice, you know, good public health measures, improve ventilation of schools, space out kids. You know, all that's true, and there hasn't been an outbreak of, uh, a really big outbreak in middle school and, and, and lower schools. But to me, it's just stupid. I mean, this is one of those things where we should just forget science. <laughs> If we want kids back in school, vaccinate all the teachers first. I mean, I don't have a problem with, there's no scientific basis for it. They're more likely to get infected from their friends in the community than they are from kids in school. But if we gotta get, if we think kids in school is important, vaccinate the teachers first and let them get back into school. So I know that's not scientifically based, but that's my opinion and I'm sticking to it. Uh, the other thing I think it's pretty clear is Wear your mask. If you stop wearing your mask, we're all screwed. So just don't stop wearing your mask until we get the country vaccinated. And I think it's pretty clear also that booster shots are in our future. As these variants come up, we're going to have to be able to respond and vaccinate people to variants. And by the way, even when we're okay, the U.S. thinks we're okay, the rest of the world is going to have this virus chugging along and churning. And there will be variants cropping up, not in Brazil and South Africa, but who knows, all over the world. And so we're going to be having to be vaccinated against those variants as they come up. So I think booster shots, no question, are in our future for the next several years. So I want to end today with uh, a couple of shout outs. First of all, this past week was, uh, it, it, it had the Residence Day. Our residents have done so much to take care of people. They're often forgotten uh, because people are thinking about healthcare workers as nurses and the doctors, but the trainees are all there. And, they do so much for us, and so I want to really have a giant shout-out for the Residence Day, which happened to also correlate with the week of National Margarita Day. So in order to celebrate the Residence Day, I had a few margaritas, but that's just, that's just me. And then, of course, I do want to uh, acknowledge the fact that so many people in Houston and Texas really suffered. It wasn't their fault. This uh, polar <laughs> vortex that came down and just froze everything was, a, a, was really a mess, uh, you know, we weren't prepared for it for sure. And I think there's gonna be a lot of issues in the legislation to try and make sure that this doesn't happen again. But a lot of our, our faculty and staff really suffered tremendous damage to their homes. We've actually started uh, a support fund to help them recover. And then the last thing, of course, is I, I don't wanna be glib about it. We did pass this milestone of 500,000 deaths, which is just an absolute tragedy for this country more than you know any war uh and a lot of lot of just tremendous loss personal loss and loss to the to the country so um it's a good time to take stock in the fact that you know we we're surviving this but many people did not uh, and so uh we've lowered our flags to half staff as well in honor of those who passed away that said weekend's coming up it's going to be over 70 degrees here in texas have a great weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.